Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Fisher and I am going to be teaching you a little bit about the social interaction theory by Lev Yevgotsky. All right, before we go diving into his theories, I want to tell you guys a little bit about Lev. He is an amazing contributor to both the fields of psychology and education. And I think that's really important to note because, you know, there's a lot of theories that we learn about and that we do not apply. But this guy, I'm sure that every single person who has taught students has implemented his theories without even knowing it uh, or knowing who this guy is. He was a Soviet psychologist, um, and unfortunately, he died at a young age of 37 um, while he was taking care of his younger brother who had tuberculosis. He had contracted the disease and shortly thereafter died. Fortunately for him and for all of us educators, he had some awesome friends who made sure that his work was not forgotten, that it was, it was finished. Now, because of this, it was, you know, a couple decades before any of this really got released or, or got any attention. So it did take a while. All right. So Lev firmly believed that young children were curious and they were, in, they were actively involved in their own learning. This is something that he and Piaget actually agreed on, which is very uncommon because they did not agree on pretty much anything. He had a perspective of so sociocultural um, interaction and learning. So this basically states that language, culture, and society are going to develop our, our cognitive, cognitive levels. I'm sorry. And without them, it's not, it's not fully possible. Okay, so full development of our cognition requires these things, especially social interaction. He even goes as far to say that any single higher order mental functioning that we do have is a result of a relationship that we have had, an interaction that we have had as a child. So it originated from that. All right, and jumping right in, these are the six assumptions that we are going to use to guide us through this presentation. It's basically the framework for Yevgatsi's theories based upon the assumptions that he has regarding social interaction and cognition. We're gonna go through each one in detail. All right, so assumption number one, adults convey to children the way their culture interprets and responds to the world. Now let's get a little bit more into what that actually means. All right, so this is basically stating that any development that we have in our early stages of life this is a result of our social environment, so our surroundings, as well as our parental instruction. Unfortunately, we don't come out as an infant and know the purpose or meaning of life. But we like to think that our parents do, right? Maybe not exactly, but they definitely know more than us when we are two weeks old, right? So our primary interactions are, are really with our parents or with our parental figures. This plays a huge role into who we are as a person. Unlike Piaget, who believed that, you know, there were some sort of fixed stages in development, um, he didn't really believe that. Like I said, you know, he and Piaget didn't really see eye to eye. He instead believed that caregivers, adults, the guardians, they are going to give their, you know, the kids a little nudge, a little bit of a help so that they can basically climb 
climb up and get higher levels of thinking and learning. So if you think of, let's say, a three-year-old, okay, and this three-year-old is asked to do simple division. If this child tries and goes at it at an individual level, um, nothing's probably going to get done. But by receiving the scaffolding from her parents, eventually, probably not tomorrow, probably not next year, but in a couple of years, she's going to be able to understand that long division. And she will no longer need that assistance from her parents. Moving on to assumption number two. Thought and language become increasingly independent in the first few years of life. All right, so before we get into Yevgotsky's, it's important to uh, note that Piaget and he were both coexisting um, in the psychology field, but that doesn't mean that they had to agree on anything, right? Right, so Piaget believed that thought and language were basically never separate entities. He kind of thought they came hand in hand and that they were never s different from one another. However, Yevgotsky thought otherwise. He believed that thought and language from infancy to age three were, were two separate processes. Not until around three years of age were these two able to merge and complement one another. All right, so you've got to believe that speech was super important because it's how, it's how we are able to communicate. Okay, it's how we're able to socialize, and it's very important, especially for parents uh, and children, because even if that speech is inaudible to most people, there is still some understanding between that parent and the child, and that allows for uh, communication to happen and basic needs to be met. You've got to believe that there were different stages of our, our language development. So in the very beginning, when we are just small, helpless creatures, until we are around one years old, we are undergoing pre-intellectual speech. Okay, so it's not really speech as we know it. It's not exactly words, but it's still an act of uh, communication. An example of this is if a baby is crying, okay? Usually, if they're crying, it means, you know, they need to be changed, they're, they're not comfortable, or they're hungry. They learn to associate those um, actions with some sort of feeling that they're having. Unfortunately, these babies can't just say, hey, mom, can you change my diaper? So they use another form of language, the form of language that they know. Soon they're going to start babbling, not making sense with their words. Um, they're going to start laugh laughing and they're going to start gesturing. And they're going to associate these actions with some sort of social contact. Again, typically all the social contact that's happening is with the parents at this level. Once we pass that pre-intellectual speech stage, we go into something called autonomous speech. And this occurs uh, between a year and a year and a half years old. We start to notice that the child is trying to communicate with the parent. And that's very important. They're trying to express their needs without always just crying for hours. So this is able to, in some way, facilitate some sort of limited communication with their adults. They're able to indicate what an object is in plain sight. You know, if they want their bottle, they can point to a bottle without actually saying the word bottle and still getting the meaning across to their parents. 
They might not be able to say the whole word bottle in the beginning of the stage, so they say ba. Soon enough, that ba will be associated with the word bottle. And that'll bring us into the naive psychology speech stage. This will occur between a year and a half and two years old. This is when they're going to start to make some connections. Although not concrete, it's a start. They're going to start realizing that objects have a, a name. There's a word associated with that object. And they're going to start making uh, connections with those words and objects as well as words and actions. The beginning of this stage, they might say a full word as, as mama. Okay. They might even invent words. But you get the point. That mama will hopefully, by two years old, uh, develop into mom. I'm hungry, or probably ma, I hungry. So they're able to create simple requests in short and pretty, pretty uh, well said sentences. Okay, and the final stage is actually separated into two different kinds of speech, and it has a much longer time span. Remember in the beginning of the slide when I said that around three years old, thought and language are going to begin to merge? Well, that is the stage that we're at now. So this stage occurs from around three to seven years old. It's going to start out with something called communicative speech. Okay, this is an external type of speech, and it's, it's for others. Okay, it's for others to get what they, what they want. I'm sorry, so the child can get what they want. For instance, I want milk. Okay, that is intended for another person. Soon it's going to develop into something called egocentric speech, which is also referred to as self-talk. And that's, that's for yourself. This is especially evident um, during difficult tasks. And it's basically when a, a child speaks aloud, kind of guiding them through the task and, and organizing their thoughts in a manner. Now, hopefully they don't uh, continue with this self-talk for too long because some people might not be so receptive to an 11 year old talking out loud to himself in order to complete a task. So fortunately, we, we start to move inward in, our, in ourselves. So it's more so internal speech, um, also known as inner speech. And this is being able to, like, talk to yourself in your head. So you're not saying everything out loud anymore. You're internalizing it and being able to merge thought and language. Now, this won't be really completely developed until around age 10. Or maybe later if the child is a slower learner. Moving on to assumption number three. Now, there's not as much to be said about assumption three as there is about the upcoming assumption. So we're not going to get too in-depth into this one. So Vygotsky thought that every... Every mental process that we have, especially the ones that are advanced, are going to stem from and originate from a, an interaction with someone. And he believed that the, the development, the cultural development that the children have, it's going to happen twice in life. First, it's going to happen at a social level which is called inner psychological, and that is at a social level, so between other people. That's how we first learn, is through our interactions. And only after it happens at the individual level, which is intra-psychological. Okay, that's happening internally. They're internalizing their social interactions to make sense of their surroundings. 
And they internalize these concepts and they, they uniquely make them their own. So in the future, they're able to see something happening or see something and they'll be able to draw their own conclusions on it based on their previous socially developed knowledge. All right, moving on to assumption number four. This is an important one. Children can perform more challenging tasks when they are assisted by an MKO. Well, what's an MKO? All right, so an MKO is, all it is is a more knowledgeable other. This is, you know, someone who has a better understanding of a specific concept than the learner, than the person that is being taught. Their duty is to provide guidance and provide support to the learner so that they can achieve something called the ZPD. We are going to get more into what ZPD is, but uh, for right now, it's just the zone of proximal development and everything will come together and make sense. So with this definition, I want you to try and think of who can possibly be the MKO in our classrooms. Go ahead and jot down a couple of things, and I will share with you the list that I have. Okay, so my list, I have the teacher. I mean, that's the most obvious one, right? We're the ones teaching our students, and hopefully we have some better understanding of what we're teaching than who we're trying to teach it to. Another example is other students. Okay, so not every student is at the same exact learning level. Learning is not a one size fits all. So we're going to have students who are more knowledgeable in a subject than their peers. They are also known as MKOs. Through co collaborative learning, um, other students can be very helpful because they can guide the students who are struggling with the content. Advanced, especially now, and we can pretty much find out anything we need to from technology. I do have another question for you, and I'm gonna have you jot it down, your answer, and we will get to it at the end. So, does age matter in terms of an MKO? Does it matter if the person is younger or older? And why or why not? Why does age matter? So go ahead and write down your answer for that. And try and think critically here. So think about maybe specific examples where you're saying it doesn't matter, but what, what uh, circumstance would it not matter? All right, jumping right into assumption number five. Challenging tasks promote maximum cognitive growth. This is where we're gonna get into the zone of proximal development so you can piece together the importance of the MKO in the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development, also known as a ZPD, is a very interesting concept. As said by Vygotsky, it is the sweetest spot for learning. It is the most productive way to teach and to learn. Okay, and this refers to basically a level of development that is attainable to the child with the help of someone else, okay, through social interaction. In other words, we can probably develop more skills when we're working with someone else rather than working by ourselves. We probably wouldn't be able to get as much done or as successful as if we were working with someone else. All right, so continuing on with the zone of proximal development. 
Okay, so learning happens because of our social interaction. So because we're interacting with our environment. Um, and what's very important to note here is Vygotsky's believe that learning comes before development. Piaget thought the opposite, that development precedes learning. But Vygotsky argues that we don't learn because we develop, but rather we develop because we learn. When we learn new things, our level of development is going to be enhanced. It is going to be to get greater. And this is where the ZPD comes into play. So to learn, we must be presented with tasks just above our present ability. So what does this mean? Basically, if you look on the picture on the right, um, you'll see three circles. Okay, in the center circle, it's what you can do. So what can the child already do? What do they already know and they can perform by themselves successfully? If we go ahead and look at the outer circle, it says what I can't do. And jumping from what I can do to what I can't do individually is not going to be the most productive way to learn. So if we are simply teaching to the level in the center of what I can do to our students, it's going to create boredom, okay? And it's not productive for learning. The same can be said also for the blue circle. And that is if we give work or content that is too difficult, that's going to just cause frustration which is not conducive to a learning environment. However, the little purple spot, what I can do with help. This is basically things that we can accomplish, um, but we do need some sort of help from someone who's more knowledgeable. So the MKO comes into play here. So through a little bit of support and encouragement, operating at this purple level, is ideal for learning. In a sense, we're tapping into their prior knowledge and we're enhancing that prior knowledge. We're jumping from step A to B in a linear fashion. If we remain at the yellow, what I can do, it's very redundant. It's like jumping from step A to step A to step A, and you get the point. It's not going anywhere. It's not leading to anything. On the other hand, if we give too difficult of tasks, it's like asking our students to go from step A to step T without them knowing the steps in between. And that is just going to cause frustration. That is jargon. An example that I, I thought of, um, of this situation and putting it into play, is if we took a honors 10th grade geometry class. An example of a task that would be considered too easy for these students would be long division. Okay, they've already learned this years ago. Reteaching it would not teach them anything. Instead, they're, they're remaining stagnant in their learning. If we decide to give them some, some calculus, okay, these students have not yet learned calculus, and that's, that's going to be too complicated. But, a ZPD, so teaching in their zone of proximal development, is asking the students to visualize relationships between two and three dimensional objects. Okay, so they should have some understanding of geometry so far, and every other math class that they've taken in the past is leading up to being able to complete this task. I will have to admit that I did look up standards for geometry in high school because I'm not super talented in the uh, subject but that is age appropriate for their learning. I wanna give you uh, a second to basically give me an example of a task that may be too easy, a task that'd be too challenging and the appropriate ZPD in that situation and make sure that it relates to the content that you teach as well as the grade level that you teach. So make sure you jot that down as we go through. The final assumption we're going to breeze through, um, and this is the assumption that play is going to allow children to stretch themselves cognitively. It's going to expand their cognition. Okay, so I just put a lot of uh, pictures here. Um, and what we see that's common in, in all three of these photos is children interacting and playing. 
playing for children is almost imitation. So they are pretending to be something that they are not, whether that is a doctor, an astronomer, um, a mother, or a teacher. It's not really feasible for a three-year-old, a four-year-old to be one of these roles, right? But they're imitating what they have learned from social interactions. So through, through taking on these different roles and trying out, you know, different uses of language, they're going to go on a journey of being able to externally regulate and then eventually being able to internally regulate their cognition. They're starting to regulate their own thought processes. All right, so now that we have gone through the six assumptions of Vygotsky's theory, um, let's, let's talk about how we can apply this in our own classrooms. Okay, so here's some ways that Vygotsky's theories are being played out in classrooms. Reciprocal teaching. This is when teachers and students are both working together in learning. So it's not one or the other. It's they're working collaboratively. Eventually, the teacher's role is going to decrease over time. So it's kind of like starting off with a lecture, then working in a group, and then having the student apply their knowledge independently. Okay, another way that we do this, and it's super important, is differentiation. Okay, we all know that learning is not, again, a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Everyone learns differently, okay? But that does not mean that they can't learn. So although every student is going to learn differently, they can all learn with a little bit of help from their MKO, in this case, the teacher. We have to be cognizant of these differentiated ZPDs. We all have those classes where we have those super, super, just intrinsically motivated and intelligent students who get honors roles since they were in kindergarten. And then we have those other kids who aren't that, right? So instead of just appealing to one and making our, our teaching a one-size-fits-all, we have to appeal to the needs of all of our students. And this can get difficult, but with practice, differentiation is super helpful, and in the long run, it's very beneficial. Okay, because of this differentiation, we are able to do collaborative learning. So we have students at these high levels, and then we have these lower level students. By placing the higher level students with the lower level students, the more advanced students can, um, they can, they can help and assist the lower level students uh, to operate within their own uh, zone of proximal development. So the, the kids are teaching the kids. Awesome, right? Okay, scaffolding is kind of like the, the steps. So you're going to want to activate your students' prior knowledge. So what, what do they know um, and what can they currently do? And taking that into effect, that's how we build off of our lesson. Again, we want to reach right above their current levels. Nothing too high and nothing too low. So building off of what they do know, how can we move on to the next step? How can you assist them and have them work on it successfully so that one day, sooner than later, they will be able to do it on their own and not need your help, which is scaffolding. Okay, I have one more question for you guys, and that is what ways do you use scaffolding in your classroom, and do you find them effective? Some scaffolding that I use in my own classroom is modeling. Okay, we do a lot of modeling in my classroom. So when we're doing a lab or anything, I, I show them what, what needs to be done and hope that they internalize it. Another way that I, I do it is through guided practice. So that's kind of the I do, we do, you do, right? You're gradually releasing your responsibility and you're leaving the accountability on to the specific student. So what are some ways that you use it in your own classroom? And have you seen them to be an effective means?
All right, so coming to an end, I just wanted to remind you of the four discussion questions that were throughout the PowerPoint. And to be super corny and end this, I'll read what I wrote here. Assuming this lesson fell right into your ZPD, with a little bit of help from your MKO, which is yours truly, Lev would be truly disappointed if you did not answer these. Do not disappoint Lev. And with that, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation, and I look forward to hearing some of your answers to these questions and conversing with you all. Have a good day.